okay. Some of you do. <laughs> Today, the title of the message is Promises, Promises. Promises, promises. So many are made and so few are kept. You know the feeling? Yeah. Politicians are notorious for it. Making promises in order to gain votes. Sales reps make promises in order to get your business. Even in relationships, men and women make promises to each other to get whatever they want. But as you know, so many of those promises are broken. Politicians break their promises all the time. Sometimes uh, it's because once they get into the negotiations and stuff, there's contradictions and they, they, somebody has to give in, and so it, they break their promises. Other times they just plain lied to you, and so the promise meant nothing. Uh, sales reps often over-promise and under-produce. You know, they tell you how great the product's going to be, and then it's not all that. Or sometimes it's just their stock runs out, and so they have to give you something else. Uh, even in relationships, uh, many times people, once they get into the relationship that they work so hard to get into, find it's really not all that after all. Um, and so promises get broken. With people, it seems that there are no certainties. Um, and there really are no guarantees in this life uh, when it comes to people. But with God, a promise made is a promise kept. With God. Promises. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, it says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. He upholds his covenants. In fact, in Joshua 21, verse 45, it says, Not one of all the Lord's good's promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Every promise God ever made to Israel, he kept. Every one of them. Now, when you think of that on a, on a human level, we think, no way. Nobody can always keep their promises every time. But God does. Every time. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Doesn't matter how many he makes or how big they sound. God keeps his promises. Let me give you a few examples. And actually the first one uh, is... It's a promise, but it kind of comes in the form of a warning. In Genesis chapter 2, God said this. He said, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. That was his promise to Adam. You know, Adam and Eve, did you know that they, originally they were going to live forever? That, originally that was the plan. They're going to live forever. But God says, if you eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. And sure enough, Genesis 4, 22, just a couple chapters later, Adam died. God kept his word. Then uh, that dirty, rotten scoundrel, the serpent, who was involved in that whole process of leading uh, Adam and Eve astray, in Genesis 3, verse 14, uh, the Lord spoke to the serpent, and he was prophesying and promising about a future day when Jesus, he said, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And we know that was fulfilled, and Colossians 2.15 tells us so, that Christ triumphed over them by the cross, and so he crushed that serpent's head. And then God made some more promises. Abraham is kind of called the father of the faith. Uh, in Genesis 15, Abraham's having a conversation with God, and that's just an interesting thought there all by itself, isn't it? He's having a conversation with God. I think we ought to have conversations with God. What do you think? And we can certainly do it. Abraham is having this conversation with God. He says, you've given me no children, and so a servant in my household is going to end up being the heir. They're going to get my inheritance, a servant. And then the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. 
And if you know the story, Abraham was getting pretty advanced in years, older than I am. So you know that's really old, okay? And he's saying, I, I don't have a son, and so all this that I've accumulated over life, I'm going to have to give it to a servant. And God says, no, no, no. You're going to have your own son who will be your heir. And then in Genesis 17, God got even more specific, and he spoke about Sarah, Abraham's wife, who was also up in the years. And he says, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. God promised that. And then just a few chapters later, Genesis 21, it says, The Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Not only did he fulfill it, but it was exactly in the time that he said, God keeps his promises. And then let's talk about a few more promises and very pertinent to our, this time of year, the birth of Christ was a promise from God. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it's the Lord himself uh, will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. That was the prophecy. This profound thing that a woman who had never been with a man in any way is going to give birth to a son. Luke chapter 1, that prophecy is fulfilled. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign forever over the house of Jacob. His kingdom will never end. And remember, Abraham, the father of our faith, and Sarah, God promised that they would, uh, their descendants would be kings. And now, here's Jesus, about to come on the scene. The angel saying, he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. And then it says, how will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? Isn't that what Isaiah said? Hundreds of years earlier, and the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Hundreds of years in advance, God promised that there would be a miraculous birth, and that birth would lead to some amazing things. There was also a promise in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And so uh, God promised that it would not only would this birth take place uh, from a virgin, a miraculous birth, but it would specifically take place in the town of Bethlehem. Luke chapter 2. Joseph went up to the town uh, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. In Bethlehem, just like God promised. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. God keeps his promises. And some of his promises are very detailed. And he keeps his word. Just a side note, I'm sure uh, most everybody will be celebrating Christmas some, some form sometime this week. And here's just the outline of the record, of the, of the biblical record of the Christmas story. Basically, it goes like this. Luke 1, Matthew 1, Luke 2, Matthew 2. Okay, in Luke 1, Gabriel visits Mary. In Matthew 1, the angel visits Joseph. In Luke 2, Jesus is born and the shepherds visit. And then in Matthew 2, the wise men visit and then the family escapes to Egypt. That's 
basically the progression of the Christmas story. And uh, I think it's helpful to know just how the best way to approach that and read that. And I encourage you to do that, to read the actual biblical account of the birth of Christ. Because after all, that's what Christmas is really about, right? Okay. I know it's about presents, too. Looking forward to some presents. But it all started with the gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate gift, and so we celebrate his birth. But then the Lord made some other promises about Christ, and he promised that Christ would die. Isaiah 53 is filled with this. Uh, Starting in verse 5, it's kind of seeing into the future, and it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would die. And we find the fulfillment in John chapter 19, verse 16. It says, he carried his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha, and here they crucified him. God keeps his promises. And then, um, in again later in John chapter 19 and verse 33, it, it even gets more detailed. It says, when they came to Jesus, uh, the soldiers were going around kind of checking everything, and they found that he was already dead, and so they didn't break his legs, which, by the way, was a prophecy that was fulfilled. And then instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. That's exactly what Isaiah said. He was pierced for our transgressions. God keeps his promises. Another part of Isaiah says uh, that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And in Matthew chapter 26, where it gives the record of Jesus standing before the high priest, and the high priest says to him, aren't you going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. Exactly what God said would happen. God keeps his promises. But that's not all. There were promises about the resurrection of Jesus too. Yeah. Mark chapter 8. Jesus himself began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And Luke chapter 9 has a very similar account. Luke 9, 22. He said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Okay? This is early in Mark and Luke. And then late in Matthew chapter 28, we find the story. The angels said to the women who had gone to the tomb, they said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. And then they say, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And then in Luke 24, laid in the... In in the text of Luke, he says a very similar story. He says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, I love this, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. 
And then they remembered his words. It was just as he predicted. And by the way, side note, the record of the resurrection of Jesus is indisputable. There have been many very capable people that have tried to disprove the resurrection, but have failed to do so. In fact, some of those people who were out to prove his resurrection to be a fraud actually became believers when they realized the evidence was overwhelming and undeniable. People have researched it and even intentionally tried to tear it down, and they can't. There's too much evidence. Jesus rose from the dead, just as he said. He keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. But there's still more. Let's talk about the return of Christ. John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. That's his promise. Have you, have you, does God have a track record here? He keeps his promises. Acts 1, starting in verse 9, after Jesus had spoken to the disciples, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. The Apostle Paul is writing, he says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That's a promise from God. And God keeps his promises. 1 Corinthians 15. Let me give you another one. Verse 51 and 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. It's a promise from God. It doesn't say, now we might get changed someday. It says, we will be. And then Revelation, multiple times. Revelation 3, I am coming soon. Revelation 22, 7, behold, I am coming soon. Revelation 22, 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. God keeps his promises. And he promised that he's coming back for his people. And we will be changed. We will be clothed with immortality. Oh, can you imagine that? No more death or mourning or crying or pain. That sounds pretty good. (laughs) And God promised all of that. And again, God what? Keeps his promises. So, how should we respond to this? Matthew 24 Jesus tells us. He's kind of talking about the end times and how things are going to play out. And he says this, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. You know, he promised he would come, but he didn't tell us exactly when. So we should keep watch. And then he gives an illustration. He says, you know, if the owner of the house 
knew exactly when the thief would come. He would have uh, been awake and not let that break in happen. And he says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. So we know he's coming, but we don't know exactly when, so we just need to be ready. And then Luke 21, verse 36 says, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. There it is again. Just be ready. God promised that Jesus is coming again. He did give us some signs, things that we could look to and know that it's getting close. And if you know the word, I'm not going to elaborate on it at this moment, but if you know the word, there's signs that have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled that would indicate that, boy, it could be any moment now. It could be before we get out of church today. Jesus, come. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 Uh, I read part of this before where it says we will be with the Lord forever, and then it ends with this. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And I have a hard time finding much that would be more encouraging than knowing that Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him. And we get to be reunited with those who have gone ahead of us, And we get to see the Lord face to face. And we get to experience new eternal bodies that won't fail and, you know, all the stuff we deal with here. (laughs) None of that. But we have that to look forward to. And it's going to happen soon. Because God keeps his promises. That ought to fire you up a little bit. Kept his promise to Adam to Abraham, promises about the birth of Christ, promises about the death of Christ, promises about the resurrection, and he made some promises about the return of Christ. And those are our promises. And God keeps his promises. Amen? Well, let's stand and let's kind of get ourselves in the groove here and stand on those promises. Oh, yeah, crank it on up a bit. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing. Standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promise.